this is where we get into kind of more detailed um, how to use the guidebook. So the nice thing is after we go through this presentation, hopefully you will be able to pick up the guidebook and say, you know what, based on what was discussed today, I know where to dive in and I know how to make this really useful for me. So, and again, the idea is that this would be a go-to resource for transit organizations to, to improve their workforce sustainability and um, also to have tools that you need to do so. So we feel like we provide a lot of um, hopefully helpful content and, and very practical um, instruments in here. Let's talk about how to use. So again, I, I mentioned, you know, of course you can use that route map that you find in the introduction. You may know exactly what you need. You may say, you know what, am, image management is our, str our struggle, so we're going to pick up module three. Um, having said that, ICF would really, if you ask, you know, if you ask for my recommendation about what's the best way to start, um, ideally, of course, we'd like you to start with the introduction, and we'd like you to work through and download all four modules. We understand in practice sometimes our time doesn't allow for that. We've built the guidebook where you can easily, each module stands on its own, but then it's also built intentionally in a series so that if you're trying to get a comprehensive picture, you can start off with the introduction and move in order through mo module one through four. So let's talk about the introduction. In the introduction, we, we give the definitions so you can help understand the relationship of various HR processes. I mentioned recruitment, retention, training and development, and professional capacity building, all be, being kind of these, these various um, cornerstones, we feel like, of, of HR strategy and, and workforce development. Then you'll see um, there's a module in practice. And, and I really like this. These are example scenarios. We've We've taken out any identifying information, but they really are realistic, and they're built on real-world examples of challenges that transit systems have faced. So for each module, we give you kind of a, here's how you might use this module to answer some real issues that you have. Um, and then you move into the section on learning how to use the module. And this is, this is a great section because you can see these graphics, and the intent is not for you to necessarily be able to read the content in these graphics right now, but just to visually um, see what they look like. We have, on the how to use section, we have these various highlights of um, example programs and example questions that you might have in your transit system. For example, the questions that we just showed you earlier, how do I start attracting uh, better candidates in the shortest amount of time? And we provide you some quick examples there. So even if, even if you only had time to read the introduction, I think there's a lot of rich content that you could take away from that introduction. So, um, I believe the introduction is less than 20 pages, so it's something I feel like most people can can sit and read in you know an hour or less and, and get hopefully a lot of rich information from. Um, step two is you got to determine your immediate needs. So again, do you need to download a single module, or do you want to say, you know what, we, I don't know where we are. I don't really know what our challenges are. Um, should I review them all in chronological order? The reason I always recommend going through all the modules is because a lot of times we think, oh, you know what, our issue is one thing, like, okay, retention is a problem. We have high attrition rates. And why is that? And we immediately jump to, well, it's just that's the way it's going to be because of the area that we're in and other organizations are much more competitive in terms of salary. So clearly it's a salary issue. Well, research actually has found that salary is not the number one driver in most cases to why people leave an organization. So perhaps there's some other things that are going on and we need to be looking at how how we're supporting people? Are we providing developmental opportunities? Are we doing that on the job? Um, you know, perhaps our training budgets are restricted, but are we making sure that people are getting the growth opportunities they need? So, so again, that's why I think it's so valuable to try to look at these in a chronological order. And the nice thing about each module, um, to keep them from being so daunting, is that there is a table of contents in each module. There's also a table at the beginning of each module that for example, in Module 1 that has strategies, you'll see a table that lists all the strategies. It tells you the target audience, meaning um, does this apply to job candidates? Does it apply to community members? Does it apply to staff? It'll tell you the various job types that that strategy applies to. And it'll also tell you um, the implementation time frame. So if you're like, I don't have time to implement a two-year strategy. I need something quick. Well, then you can quickly look at what boxes are checked, and then you find the page number, and you can go right to the page number for that strategy. So we try to make it as, as easy to navigate as possible. We also have a highlights table for each subsection. Um, so for recruitment, for example, we list all the strategies. I, there, I believe there's 10 or 11 strategies for recruitment. Overall, I know we have 42 strategies in that, in that module one, but there's 10 or 11 for recruitment. And then you can see there's going to be a little diagram that looks just like 
this box right at the beginning of the chapter, and it'll highlight um, all the strategies that are, that are addressed for recruitment. And then you can actually read the detailed text for those recruitment strategies that interest you and review the real-world real transit and non-transit examples. I cannot say enough how much we appreciate all of the participants, and I will feature them in a minute, that were involved in this study because they were really candid with us about here's what we're doing in our organization, here's what didn't work, here's what did. And so we have some really great examples in there. And then we were able to spend a little bit of time uh, focusing on some non-transit um, other industry examples as well. Um, I will admittingly say that that wasn't the heavy emphasis here, but it is something we were able to start approaching um, just through some of our research. So you will find some examples there as well from like Whole Foods, AT&T, Sprint. So it's kind of neat to see other industry practices. And then again, I, as I pointed out, look at those abbreviated approaches in Appendix B. Okay, so that's how to use the guidebook. Let's go module by module and talk a little bit more about what's in each module. In module one, um, again, this is what I talked about before. This is how to tailor effective strategies into real workforce practices. So I tend to think of a strategy as here's an idea, here's a way to do this in a very systematic way that's going to lead to positive outcomes. But then what does that look like in practice for my organization? So when you start implementing it in your organization, that's when it becomes a practice in my mind. And I'm just clarifying. So when, when you hear the terms, you know what I, I mean. Um, and again, our strategies were around recruitment retention, training and development, professional capacity building, and, um, and so those were kind of the four areas that we focused strategies around. You'll see some examples here on this slide of the different strategies um, that are presented. So let me just pick one here, just, just for example's sake. There's 42 total strategies, so we didn't list them all here. But if you look at recruitment, incorporating realistic job previews. Um, this may sound really obvious, what is realistic job preview? But we found that actually by incorporating realistic job previews in a very specific way as we outline in the strategy, then we're providing people with enough information to make wise decisions about job choices so that they can self-select out of the process before you even get into the onboarding training. You know, I think um, sometimes our tendency is to say all the good stuff about the job and not present some of the challenges. The problem there is that then we find people get into the training and they're shocked and then they leave and then now we've wasted those recruitment dollars and we've got to quickly scramble to find new candidates to come in and perhaps not even do that in a very strategic way. So again, realistic job previews are great. There's some good examples there. I know Washington DOT, I think, is one of those with that YouTube video where this, um, transit systems have actually used live employees who to do little quick bios or quick little briefings of what the job is like. And that's a really great way to uh, preview your workforce to the outside community as well as provide those realistic job previews. So you'll, you'll see that some of those examples. So again, here are some of the strategies that you see within each of the um, organizational process areas. Um, job rotation program, another great way to say, you know what, we don't have a, a big training budget, but we need to get people, um, we want people to feel like they're really a part of this organization and that they have a broader perspective of what we do. So again, that's a, a great example of a strategy under professional capacity building. Module one, let's just get more detailed here. So let's just say your example challenges our community is diverse, but we are not. I mentioned this earlier. So what does it mean? We need to start recruiting and supporting non-traditional applicants. So I'm going to go to strategy four, recruitment strategy four on recruiting non-traditional applicants. And basically, every page are five elements. One is the, you know, it tells you what organizational process it is, recruitment. It tells you the name of the strategy. There's a description for the strategy. And then we even have some key implementation steps. What do I need to do to start recruiting? Um, and then we have examples of programs. So for example, Minnesota DOT's Community Advisors on Recruitment and Retention, their CARS program, they partner with local minority organizations. I mentioned an example of this earlier. Um, Transit Authority of River City, Louisville, Kentucky, they developed a recruitment initiative aimed at young single parents. And that includes a mentoring program. Again, if we're going to bring in people that are you know, that are more diverse than what we currently have in our organization, we have to think about how to support these individuals so they feel like they fit and they're an integral part of the organization. So mentoring is a, is a really important way to, to do that. So um, those are just a, a couple of examples there. Let's move into talking about Module 2. Module 2, again, is the metrics. It's the measurement piece. I think one of the things that we've found is that 
we may hear a lot about different practices, but we don't know whether it's really going to make a difference for us. So this is the thing. I was very excited that we had an opportunity to pilot these uh, metrics through a series of small web surveys. And I was particularly excited to hear from some of the participants that they went ahead and tried out those scorecards and, and decided by looking at the met some of the metrics in the scorecard, they also decided, you know what, there's other data we should be collecting on some of our existing practices. Um, some of them even said they changed some of their existing practices and, and uh, are finding more success as a result of the scorecards. But we got some really great reports. So I encourage you, please download those editable scorecards. And, um, and if you're looking at those and saying, you know what, these scales don't work for us, well, the good news is in this module we provide you guidance on how to develop the scales. It sounds simple enough, but it's funny how we start developing scales and we realize that our scale points are not always um, as distinct as they need to be or they don't cover the range of information. So we provide all that practical guidance for you right in this module. Um, and again, there's eight scorecards. So there's basically there's uh, two scorecards per organizational process. So two for recruitment, two for retention, two for training and development, and two for professional capacity building. We'll talk a little bit about what those look like. Um, and the reason there's two is because we started developing the scorecards and realized that the kind of metrics we use to evaluate whether a practice is effective for management and professional staff is probably different than for the frontline staff and, and, um, and some of those technical staff. So it made sense to develop the two types of, of uh, scorecards. Um, no doubt you could probably have scorecards for every different job type, but there, you know, there gets to be a point at which we realize that you know, some of those nuances really aren't what we're looking at. We need to understand at, a, at an organizational level how these, how these different practices have, what the implications of them are. So that's why we thought those two distinctions were most meaningful, and we, we gathered data and, and kind of vetted them with our um, participants, and they agreed. So, um, again, the features of Module 2, for each metric, there's an explanation of what the metric is, why it's important to measure, and how to measure it. So, for example, I don't have this data. How do I capture it? It's going to be described for you right there in the scorecard. Um, so I think we talked about this. And the idea is that the measurement that you're trying to capture is the likelihood that this program is going to be successful for us. It's not how do I measure up to somebody else. That's not what our focus was here. It was how do we know that this is going to be important for us, and I'm not going to use the scorecard to, to compare myself against um, ABC Transit, because that just wouldn't be appropriate here. So I wanted to reiterate that. Um, OK, so in practice for Module 2, let's say the example challenges we've heard of successful um, management training strategies, but we're concerned about which us. And so there's a scorecard titled Training and Development Practices. And we're going to look at management, advisory, administrative, and technical position score. That one scorecard that management professional addresses all those different groups. And so you'll see here's our scorecard. And that's visually what it looks like. The idea here is that you're, um, you're going to go through each metric one by one. So you're going to say, OK, you know what? If I implement this type of training, or maybe I've already implemented it, what would, my, what would be my post-training uh, skill testing? What, what would it look like? You know, um, what percentage, how effective would it be? So looking at um, post-training effectiveness, one way to measure that is um, you know, looking at the skills that have been acquired at the end of training. And we talk specifically about ways to measure uh, post-training testing. You know, what, what kinds of tests should you do to see if your training is effective? And then you can give yourself a score um, based on where, where you would fall on that scale for this particular practice. And again, you're going to use this scorecard to measure and compare two different practices. And there's several metrics there, the recency of training materials. So has, are these training materials older than 10 years? Are they something that we've updated in the last year? You know, and again, these scale anchors can be changed. What's important, really, is the score total that you give a particular practice compared to another practice. So you kind of have some freedom in, in terms of the judgments that you make. Like, for example, I, I tell folks, don't get too concerned about whether you give yourself a 52 or a 60. We know what matters is that you use that same judgment and that same rationale when you're evaluating a different practice so that in the end, your score comparisons make sense. Hopefully that. That was clear. Um, OK, so moving on to Module 3, this is about image management. Again, we focus particularly on local community level receptiveness um, 
to transit organizations. We heard from our panel that this was important. You know, a lot of times we think we talk about image management on a global level, but as um, as smaller organizations, we don't know what that means or what our role is in that. And we have five questions and then five answers. So we go through and describe the strategies and give specific answers, and then we get very clear examples. So um, the way that this module is set up for Module 3 is that we have kind of seven key challenges that transit industry deals with. And then we break those down into um, five opportunities that can be leveraged for success. We don't want to imply that we're not doing anything right. We need to think about what are we doing right, how can we leverage what's being done right, and maybe market that a little bit better. And so that's kind of what we mean by those opportunities. And then we give examples of other effective practices that are used in organizations. And then in terms of those five Q&As that I mentioned, I presented these earlier, but does your agency understand and manage its brand? Do you listen to your target audience and your marketing efforts? Do you use employees to spread your message? We give very specific strategies for how to address those questions. Here's an example here. You can see a transit leader question. Do potential applicants know about white collar career opportunities within your agency? And then we give answers to that. Um, here's a strategy. Consider the unique attributes of your local system and then feature these components in advertisements. And VIA was gracious enough to give us a lot of um, screenshots of things that they've been doing because they really marketed themselves and, and made some pretty substantial changes in defining their image and engaged the community, as I mentioned, with the Prius cars in doing that. So we uh, really appreciate them doing that. Um, and, and they were just gracious enough to offer that. So. Um, again, you can see right here, for example, strategy question one, does your agency understand and manage its brand? We have some very specific examples. Here's an example of other industries, Whole Foods, what they're doing around social responsibility, Amazon, how they're creating that emotional appeal, Apple, how they're addressing um, financial performance and, and highlighting the economic, the positive economic impact that they're making. So again, these are all um, really good practical examples. Okay, so just in terms of how to use this module, you might say, well, we don't know how to dispel the negative ideas that the community has about transit in general or about our agency, okay? Let's say we've already tried putting up billboards about the agency or we've tried posting flyers and it's just, it's not working. And the one means of doing this is to create partnerships with other organizations. I think the questions about partnerships came up earlier. And so we talk about one solution and how to go about leveraging those partnerships to have a better standing in the community and help us throw out a more positive image about what we're concerned about. I don't think there's any harm in saying, you know what, being honest with your community and saying, you know what, we haven't really always approached this the right way. And we realize that you're an important part of, of our success. And so here's how we want to approach things differently. And I think um, reinventing yourself and, and doing focus groups with community members is an excellent way to do that. So that's just one example of kind of that localized image management. Okay, and next we have um, Module 4, which is, again, the engaging and continuous improvement via benchmarking. And the purpose of this module is to outline a comprehensive and a systematic approach to benchmarking in order to achieve results that are actionable and replicable. So there are five phases of benchmarking, and for each of these phases, we have two to three tools. So we talk about planning, and I would probably argue that's one of the most important and, and also one of the most overlooked pieces of benchmarking. Um, benchmarking, in my mind, is not picking up the phone and saying, hey, how did you do this, and how do I go about making changes that reflect what you did? It's much more about being careful in terms of the partners that we select, understanding what criteria we're using to select them, and then figuring out exactly what is it we want to study. Do we want to figure out what they're doing, their overall training and development strategy is, or do we want to understand a specific training initiative? And some of that is about doing kind of that introspective analysis and, and figuring out what changes do we need to make? Where do our problems exist? For example, if we have high attrition rates, are we even doing exit surveys to figure out why those rates are so high? Are we asking our workforce if they're engaged and satisfied with their work? Or are we just afraid to ask that question at all? You know, sometimes just asking the question in and of itself is a positive intervention because it shows that we care and that we want to make positive changes. Um, and, and some of these things can be done in a very simple way. I know some of this can seem daunting, like, oh my goodness, I'm going to plan out this huge benchmarking study. Well, the nice thing is, again, you have the tools within this module, but you also have that Appendix B, which is an abbreviated approach to benchmarking. So we, we try to lay this out in a very simple way. And because we realize how time-constrained you are, um, 
you know, not because we're trying to, you know, overly simplify these concepts. You know, some of these things we say, oh, we could do that and we get it, but it's going to take a lot of time. So what we try to do is map out for you what are the priorities, what should you be doing first, and here are some real simple tools you can fill out. So we talk about developing a communication plan. Well, guess what? We give you the template for the communication plan, so you can just go in and start using that type of tool and populating it yourself. So um, again, you know, I'm very excited about the number of tools that we provide in this guidebook, and I hope you are too. Um, so I just want to show you these are, um, this is the process for benchmarking that we lay out um, in the guidebook in Module 4. Okay, um, here's some other tools that you'll find in the module. So for some of you are very visual, some of us are still better with text, and so if you're like, okay, I read this text, but now I need to know what are the step-by-step -step involved, what decisions do I need to make, we have these process maps. So if you look right here, this is an example of a process map. Both the orange triangles represent decision points, and the, um, the rectangles, the blue, are really the different processes. Okay, so an, a challenge you might say is we see other companies are successfully recruiting employees and we want to know what's working for them and who to study. One thing that needs to happen here is that you need to go through and actually map out, you know, what are the partners and what are the factors that would play into, um, you know, that would impact our benchmarking and, and the data that we collect and how we interpret data. So we have this benchmarking partner selection tool where you can go in and list here are some examples of their systems that I think I might want to study. And then here are some criteria that help me determine whether they're a good one to talk to. You know, obviously, if they're not willing to participate or give me information, that may not be <laughs> a good, good place to start. Um, how similar are they to me you know, in terms of the service, services they provide? Um, what, what about the size of the organization? I feel like all, all organizations, no matter your age, size, whatever, you, there's something that we can all learn from one another. But we also need to be careful about how we spend our resources when we're trying to do benchmarking. So. Here's some other screenshots. We have a gap analysis tool that helps you actually um, determine, okay, where are our performance gaps? What are some of the gaps that the um, other organizations that I'm studying have? And how can we use their information to help close some of these gaps? I talked about the communication plan here. That's what you can see here under um, phase three integration. How do you integrate? So for example, if you identify a practice that another organization has and you said, we're going to adopt that, it's very important to be strategic about communicating that with your organization. If you just come in and say, okay, we're going to start this new program, and you don't have employee buy-in or leadership buy-in especially, you're going to have a lot of resistance to that. And unfortunately, it can be a really well-developed program, but because of the strategy you take to communicate it, it can end up being sabotaged by um, negative perceptions or resistance. I always say engage your workforce early on. You don't have to have all the answers. Start initiating employee groups and designating champions within different functional areas to say, you know what, we want to implement this new practice. I want somebody to stand up and champion it. But, you know, you talk to employees directly within your unit, so how about you champion this? Um, kind of brings me back to that example I gave you earlier in San Diego where, you know, the director said, you know what, I'm trying to implement an absentee policy with transit operators, but I'm not the one that has the most direct contact. So why not disseminate this to the road supervisors and why not have them active and in developing the policy because they know what the challenges are, and that was a real success. So again, um, you know, think about engaging your workforce, and that's what the communication tool helps you do. Great. Well, I just want to quickly talk about future directions. So these are trends I keep hearing about, about across transportation. So I just thought it'd be a good way to kind of sum things up today. Anyway, I think in terms of major trends, I mean, obviously the baby boomer retirements. I can't tell you how often I hear about this. And I think the question we need to be asking ourselves is, do we know where our, our current competency gaps exist and which ones are going to matter in the future? Um, you know, I think sometimes there's a tendency to think if one person leaves, then we need to fill that with, with one person. And there's a lot of presumptions there that, that perhaps could be false. One is we presume that um, two people have the same levels of proficiency on a competency. We also presume that some of those competencies are going to matter in the future when they may not. So in some cases, without sounding too crude here, sometimes um, personnel loss isn't always such a bad thing because it may be that our jobs are evolving. In other cases, uh, the loss of one person could mean that we actually need to bring in two or three people because actually the competencies they had are just going to become that much more important in the future. So again, I could see that we need to do a lot more research around competency and, and skill gaps and um, being able to project those across different types of jobs. 
Um, also, are we being strategic about succession planning and leadership development? Are we not just looking at immediate successors, but are we looking what we call three levels deep? Are we looking at cross-functional areas? You know, are we really fully leveraging the talent that we have internally? I think sometimes we think people have to stay in the same job areas. So these are all kind of interesting areas um, for, you know, just kind of food for thought to get you thinking about some of the challenges you're already facing, but even more so in the future. Um, integrated HR, does, or does the hand know what the foot's doing kind of thing? Are we thinking about recruitment when we think about training and development? Um, I think it's really interesting. You know, when we're going out to meet with people, are we telling them about the kinds of opportunities in our organization to grow? Um, and that's something I don't know that we're always doing, and, and so it's, I think that's important. I've already talked about sharing lessons learned, and then capacity building, and I talked about you know, kind of that cross-functionality piece and, and the job rotations I think is an excellent way to do that. I'm always excited to hear about these innovative job rotation programs. Um, one that always stands out to me is I remember Frito-Lay, um, when they hire an executive, you're on the truck delivering chips like the first week of your job. And, and this is for an executive. So, I mean, they're out there meeting their drivers. I mean, that's a great way to show not only the drivers that they're important, but also make sure that those executives have understand capacity across the organization and, and have that cross-functional expertise. So um, those are some areas that I think are kind of future areas for research and, and also um, strategy to emerge. Uh, the last thing I want to do is just give a second to look at these slides. I know you all received them in advance, but I can't thank our participants enough. I mean, you can just look at this list, and, and if you don't um, trust the value of our guidebook on, on just on what I said today, all you have to do is look at the participants that contributed, and I think this is enough to uh, hopefully spark your interest in, in looking at the program examples we have in the guidebook as well as the strategies, because we have some great participants here. So we did focus groups to develop the metric scorecards, as I mentioned, and then um, as well as many surveys. So here's some of the people that participated there. I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, and then we have, I mentioned the web surveys. There's a list of participants on that screen. Um, these are the individuals that tested the metrics. And again, we tried to represent rural, suburban, and urban bus and rail systems, as you can see there by the list. So I, I like the question about having a representative sample. I think that's always important as a researcher. Um, OK, and then here's some other individuals that participated and gave us insight into um, image management strategies. If, if you want further information, here's where you find the guidebook. Here's my contact information. I would love to hear from you afterwards. And uh, I can even try to help connect people if you have a question that somebody else has. So that's all from me. Thank you folks so much.